everybody, Julian Charles here of themindrenewed.com, coming to you as usual from the depths of the Lancashire countryside here in the UK. And today I'm very pleased to welcome back to the programme a guest who is always very much appreciated for his uh, great insights into matters political and economic, Dr Paul Craig Roberts. Dr Roberts has held numerous senior academic positions in universities. He was an associate editor and columnist for the Wall Street Journal and was appointed by President Reagan as Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Economic Policy during Reagan's first term in office. After that, Dr. Roberts served as a consultant to the U.S. Departments of Defense and Commerce, and he is now chairman of the Institute for Political Economy, which you can find online at paulcraigroberts.org. Dr. Roberts, thanks very much for coming back on the show. Pleased to be with you, Julian. Well, it's always a pleasure to speak with you. I mean, certainly your posts over there at paulcraigroberts.org are, you know, they continue to be a source of good information and, well, to a certain extent, a relief to me and I expect to many others. It's a kind of oasis of sanity and calm in a world that seems to be going mad in many ways. So it is, it's always great to speak with a calm and sane person. So thanks very much for coming on. And today I want to talk about a piece that you wrote on your website earlier this month called Somnolent Europe, Russia and China, and particularly because of what you say there about the European Union and the upcoming referendum here in the UK as to whether uh, we Britons should stay or leave that union. And uh, as we have this decision to make shortly on the 23rd of June, do we go for Brexit, do we not? I thought that it would be good to hear your views on this and even more particularly because of what you say about something else connected to this, the historical links between the EU and of all things, US intelligence, which is very fascinating. But perhaps we should start with your more general impressions of what's going on at the moment. You, you write in the piece that Washington is committed to the European project because it's in its own interests that that should continue. And you say that basically it's David Cameron's job, presumably under Obama's instruction to, this is what you say, scare the British people into thinking that it's too dangerous to go it alone. So let's start there. Why is Washington so averse to the Brexit vote? Well, Julian, um, we really should then start with what you're going to get to later. Mm -hmm. The EU is a creation of the CIA. And this was discovered uh, some years ago by an American professor who happened upon uh, released documents in the archive of the United States where public documents are put when they are released from their, you know, their time holding. Was it Georgetown University? I think I read some. Georgetown or George Washington, I think it was. Uh, but you see, it was reported on by the Telegraph, by Ambrose Evans Pritchard in the year 2000. And I think I mentioned that in my column, that this was 16 years ago, reported in the Telegraph by hmm. Ambrose, who was for a while, I guess, the Telegraph's correspondent in Washington. And um, the documents show that the CIA did this, basically organized, orchestrated, lobbied for the creation of the EU for two reasons. One, as a block against uh, the Soviets, and two, as enabling Washington's control, because to control all the separate European governments is much more time-consuming, demanding, involved than controlling an EU government, especially something with an EU commission that's not accountable. And so Washington set it up in order to have a firm hold on its European empire. And this goes back to, according to Ambrose Evans Pritchard, this goes back to the 1950s and 60s, I understand. Uh, yes, back to the 50s, I think it was. Mm -hmm. I don't have my article in front of me, but um, it was a creation of the CIA as a way of enhancing Washington's empire. You know, for Washington to have to go to Italy, to France, to Germany, to the British, uh, negotiate with each of these governments, the more people you have to bribe or threaten or cajole, and then the countries themselves can uh, increase their demands for what they want in return, because if one holds out, no deal can be made. Whereas, if Europe is 
dissolved, if the European countries are dissolved into one entity, then Washington only has to do with one entity. And so this was the origin of the EU for that purpose. It facilitates Washington's control, and that is why Washington has pushed so strongly to put all of Eastern Europe into both the EU and NATO, because otherwise, how many countries are there, European? I can't remember the Eastern, the Western, the 28 or 29? I think it's 28, yeah. Yeah, and, and so instead of having to deal with 28 separate governments, uh, Washington can achieve what it wants dealing with the EU. So this this is the origin. And In, indeed, it's fascinating. I mean, one of the things that comes to my mind is I've had uh, interviews with Patrick Wood, and uh, he has said things along these lines. I mean, he's very much looking at the work of the Trilateral Commission over the years. And one of the quotes he has in his book, Technocracy Rising, comes from a private conversation with David Rockefeller, which is published by and available for free download from the Trilateral Commission. So I'll link to that. So this is Pat Wood citing the words of David Rockefeller. Quote, Uh, Back in the early 70s, the hope for a united Europe, and that's all in capital letters, Europe, uh, was already full-blown, thanks in many ways to the individual energies previously spent by so many of the Trilateral Commission's earliest members. So (laughs) there is a little window into this interest that was there, as you say, going right back to the 1950s. Yeah, it's an American creation, the EU is. It was uh, orchestrated through... European individuals and under various pretexts and it was done in stages but it was essentially a CIA operation and you have to understand this is not what the professor is saying or Ambrose Evans Pritchard is saying. This is what the released CIA documents say. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Sure. When you actually go to the article that he wrote there in the year 2000, I can see that's what he says. Although he doesn't actually link through to any of those documents. But of course, one could double check on all of that. But he points to various memoranda. Um, let me just have a look at a number of things that are said here. One of the memos, this is June the 11th, 1965, advised the Vice President of the EEC, uh, Robert Marjolin, quote, to pursue monetary union by stealth, and it recommends that uh, all debate be suppressed until, quote, the adoption of such proposals will become virtually inescapable. So these are memos from the CIA that are going through there to the Vice President of the EEC. Right. The whole thing was a CIA orchestration. They used various Europeans for it, and always with some cover or pretext. Um, the documents are publicly available. Once they're released, I don't think they can then be all of a sudden reclassified. Right, so they could be checked up on, yeah. Yeah, and so all anyone would have to do would be go to the National Archive and ask for them. Clearly, it's so. It's not something being asserted. It's based on the actual CIA documents. I mean, they admit it. <laughs> yeah, and people involved, um, he actually you know, mentions a number of people. It, it seems pretty clear this is the case. I mean, he looks at this organization called an American Committee for a United Europe that apparently was created in 1948. And he says it's, it was chock full of intelligence people. Um, the chairman apparently was William J. Donovan, who had been head of the OSS, the uh, Office of Strategic Services, forerunner of the CIA, who at the time was apparently, well, ostensibly a private lawyer at the time. The vice chairman was, of all people, Alan Dulles. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And the the board included um, the CIA's first director, and he says a a roster (laughs) of ex-OSS figures and officials who moved in and out of the CIA. So there it is. (laughs) Yeah, this was uh, clearly done, And and it succeeded because Europe is very firmly under American control. Uh, Washington controls uh, Europe totally controls its foreign policy, its economic policy, controls whatever the various elected presidents say or don't say, uh, force retractions. And uh, Obama's recent visit to London was to tell Cameron to deep six this British exit from the EU. Uh, That's his marching orders, and he will do everything he can to comply because Cameron is, like every British prime minister, a puppet of Washington. He has no independent standing. He can't put uh, British interests ahead of American interests. He's not allowed. It's quite clear, as Obama said, it's American interests for Britain to stay in the EU. So what what most likely happens in these situations is the, the leaders go to people and say, oh, little England, 
we'll be insignificant by ourselves if we're not part of this big block of Europe. We'll lose our influence. If we stay in the EU, we'll have a lot of influence because we are important in the EU. But if we're not in the EU, we're not important. Mm. Things will pass us by. Little England will be little England. That's exactly and, what they do, yes. And in fact, one of the yeah. controversial things over here has been in recent months that the government spent £9 million of taxpayers' money on this glossy pamphlet that's been sent. Because we've, I've got one right here. Um, you know, to vote, stay. That's what they say we should do. And this glossy leaflet is headed HM Government, of course, so it looks nice and official. And it's titled, uh, Why the Government Believes that Voting to Remain in the European Union is the Best Decision for for the UK, and it has several points, uh, some of which you've just mentioned there. Uh, apparently, they secured a special status for the UK in Europe. We're not going to join the euro. Uh, we can keep control of our borders. We'll not be part of further European political integration, apparently. Um, tough new restrictions on access to welfare for EU migrants, and uh, they say they have a commitment to reduce EU red tape. Do you believe any of that? No, I don't believe in it. They always, this is the trick that the British government always pulls on the people whenever the issue of the EU comes up. They say, oh, we're negotiating special conditions. Mm. We're negotiating special conditions. So don't worry, don't, you don't have to worry about the immigrants because we're negotiating that part of the EU out of our relationship. You don't have to worry about EU laws taking precedence of British laws, uh, but of course we will continue to allow them to arrest you and pull you out of the country. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it doesn't actually say that in the pamphlet, no. <laughs> <laughs> because somebody uh, in Greece or something files a complaint. So they use the combination of reassurance that we have a special deal with fear that all oh, will be ruined if we're not in. So I, I don't know that the British people succeed in standing up for themselves or where they'll lose their confidence about leaving. Now, in a real respect, Britain is not in the EU because you still have the pound. And so unlike Greece or Italy or Portugal or Spain, when you get in financial trouble, the British can simply print pounds to get out. You're not dependent on private banks. You have your own central bank. But countries that use the euro do not have their own central bank in the sense of a money-creating bank because the central banks of the other euro members are no longer central banks. They still have that name, but they cannot print euros. Only the European Central Bank. And that's not controlled by the members. It is by Germany, more or less. But the other members, they have no real control over the European Central Bank, which really is run by a former Goldman Sachs executive. <laughs> the same people who run the U.S. Treasury and the Federal Reserve. <laughs> they also run the European Central Bank. So in a sense, does that mean that the UK is actually pretty much OK as things stand and we don't need a Brexit? I mean, after all, as you say, we, we're not part of the euro and they say there's going to be no further European political integration as far as the UK is concerned. So are we OK to just stay as we are? No, because you're OK for now if you get into financial trouble. They can't come in make you uh, get rid of public services, uh, national health, cut the pensions, and uh, sell off all of your public assets to private investors abroad. They can't do that to you. But, of course, you can't really be in the EU and not be in the EU. And so what happens over time is you get gradually a little bit more in it, a little bit more in it. And already, your legal system is compromised. British justice is different from European. The evidence is different. The rights of the accused are different. So already, you are losing the kinds of historical achievements that the British people fought for for centuries, beginning with Magna Carta, or even maybe earlier with Alfred the Great's uh, codification of the common law. But the type of English approach to justice, which is unique, in which the United States copied, uh, this is not present on the continent. The people don't have the same rights, and therefore you're already losing 
aspects of these historic British accomplishments by being in the EU. And you think that process would continue, irrespective of what any oh, of government here says, yeah. that there would continue to be effectively, like that quote I had yeah. before there, a continued sort of suppression of debate such that it would just seem inevitable in the end. Right, that's exactly it. It's gradually happening. Britain is more in the EU now than it was, say, five years ago. And uh, I suspect that Washington will urge the process along quicker. Uh, you know, the EU, it doesn't really make any sense to be in the EU because it destroys sovereignty. It destroys the power of the national government. But they say it's good for trade. They no, say, you know, not. they say 44% of UK trade is with the EU. This is this market of over 500 million customers, you know. If, if we were to pull out, then uh, we would lose that or we'd lose access, the kind well, of access that we have lie. at the moment. They, they lie. There's no reason to have political integration to have open markets. For example, we have open markets with Canada and Mexico, but we're not in some kind of a political unity with them. Yeah. So I agree. that's just I, a lie. Yeah. You know, all governments lie. Sure, but I, I agree in principle that you don't need to be part of a trading block in order to do trade. But yeah. I mean, one point that uh, Leon Britton made, not one of my favorite characters, but it was a point that he made, that we would be penalized. We would not really be able to trade well with the rest of the EU, they would penalize us with various tariffs and so, no, so He's lying through his teeth. Look, a trade bloc is not a political union. You don't have to have a political union in order to have a free trade zone. Mm. And originally, part of the deceit that was practiced on the Europeans was this will be a free trade zone. Then the CIA sprang on them, oh, it's going to be a political union. Well, that's another thing that Leon Britton said in one of the debates. He said that, in fact, it was known that it would be a political union and that Harold Macmillan had made that clear back in the 1960s. I might add that Nigel Farage said that was a lot of rubbish, but uh, that's what Leon Britton said. Yeah, but, well, you can go research it. It was not a political thing. It was part of the whole deception. First, it was a, a iron and coal, a steel and coal union where there's going to be some kind of tariff reduction. Then it's going to be free trade. And then it's going to be a common currency. There was no reason to have a common currency. But they pretended, oh, you have all these different currencies. It's harder to make deals. And the values of the currencies with regard to one another change. Well, none of this bothers the rest of the world <laughs> that trade. <laughs> And then it's, oh, well, you know, if we're going to have a common currency. We have to have a political union. We can't have all these different policies and still have a common currency. So it was sprung on, on them in stages. This was part of the way it was orchestrated. And it had many spokesmen. I mean, the CIA pays very well. Uh, many European politicians live very well on their CIA pensions. Um, so it's a deceit. The EU is based in deceit, and it's what the people in Britain are being told now is more deceit. You see, essentially, when the British are absorbed in the EU, they're no longer British. They're no longer a people. So they are disappeared as a people. They become Europeans. But do we not become part of a, an EU democratic entity? <laughs> It's not democratic, is it? I mean, <laughs> no. they, they, you can elect people to the parliament, but the commission seems to have the power. And as well as I understand it, the commission's not exactly elected. It's not really no. accountable. And so it's a form of a monarchy. It's like Europe is going back to rule by a ruler. So it's a reversal of history. Not only do the individual nationalities disappear, but the achievements of making government accountable to the people disappear along with them because the EU system is not set up to be accountable to people. It doesn't really matter who gets elected to that EU parliament. It doesn't seem to have any power. Power is in commission. and It doesn't have to be accountable. So there you, what, you really, what, what the EU really does, it recreates uh, ruled by aristocrats who are not accountable. It is sometimes said, isn't it, that it's the EU Parliament that actually 
makes decisions and the commission's role is just to suggest legislation. But that seems to me to be quite a power, actually. I mean, if you have the sole responsibility for bringing things to the table, then you have immense power. Right. It's set up for that. Yeah. It's set up as a dictatorship mm. and will get more so. Look, the United States uh, doesn't have a EU commission, but if we look at the balance of power that currently exists between the executive and the legislative, the legislative is essentially impotent. It's lost all its powers. The government is run by the executive branch. For example, the Constitution says that only Congress can declare war. Well, the executive branch pays no attention to it. Neither does Congress. They've just let the power go. They also say that all tax matters uh, originate in the Ways and Means Committee of the House of Representatives, but that's all compromised. Every aspect of the legislature of Congress has been compromised, and the executive branch has gained more and more power. It's really not even accountable any longer to the judiciary. For example, when Bush declared that he was going to detain American citizens indefinitely without due process, this is a complete violation of habeas corpus, which is a constitutionally protected right and one that the judiciary is expected to enforce, and they didn't do anything. And when Obama said, well, you know, I, we're not going to do anything about that, we're actually going to add to it, I've got a list of Americans I'm going to kill based on suspicion alone without due process, and the courts didn't do anything about that. And we know, for example, the executive branch, I'm talking about the United States, practiced torture, and yet torture is strictly illegal under U.S. statutory law, not just illegal under international law, to which the U.S. is a signer, but it's illegal under U.S. federal law, and nothing whatsoever was done about it. It's also strictly illegal under U.S. federal law and under the Constitution for the government to spy on people without warrants. Now, they've been doing this the entirety of the 21st century. Uh, nothing has been done about it. Here, we don't even have the EU structure, which is hierarchical, designed to produce dictatorship. We don't even have that here, but nevertheless, we're moving in that direction, where the executive branch ignores the separation of powers, ignores the powers of Congress, acts in place of Congress, and the judiciary does nothing whatsoever to enforce the law against the executive branch. And so the United States is also moving toward a dictatorship, and that's without the dictatorial structure that the EU has. So I think that uh, the British should save the whole world by exiting. See, if the British exit, that's going to be the end of the EU. Everybody's going to exit because it's a pain. It's a pain for the domestic politicians who find, you know, if you're Chancellor of Germany, you find your powers compromised by the EU membership. If you're the president of France, you find the same thing. Uh, they would like to get out. And Britain gives them the case for doing that. So this is the real reason why Obama came over here and, and said that we have this special relationship and we should, right. you know, Britain really should be best for everybody, best for America, best for the UK. And... Best for America. Best for America, yeah. right. It, America doesn't give a damn about Europe. Europe is a vassal territory. It's part of the empire. There's no independence. Washington wants to keep it that way. And of course, also, if people leave the EU, they're going to leave NATO. And then Washington can't carry on its wars. And it can't risk a nuclear war with Russia. It can't use the idiot Europeans to put pressure on Russia. So Washington's drive for world hegemony falls apart. Because, you know, the Europeans have even less interest being in NATO than in the EU. Because what they're finding about being members of NATO is they're being forced into confrontation with Russia. Well, how do they benefit from that? They've already been forced to bust up their economic and diplomatic relations with Russia, and now they're being forced into a conflict situation with Russia. 
Uh, that's not in any European's interest. I mean, you're not gonna, if a war breaks out with Russia, you're finished. It's over with. It'll never exist again. You'll be gone instantly. And this is not in your interest. What grief do you have with Russia? The whole trouble that you have with Russia is because Washington overthrew the elected government in Ukraine, thinking that nothing would happen as a consequence. And Russia said, well, look at all these Russians. They don't want to be part of that. They're coming back to us. And so, oh, you can't have them back. We're going to put sanctions on you. And then we go make Europe put the sanctions. And ever since, if you look at all the NATO commander's statements, it's always war, war, war. We got it. Oh, this Russian is going to invade the Baltics. They're going to invade Poland. They've invaded Ukraine. They're going to invade Europe. We got to have more more missile bases, more troops, more tanks, more NATO forces, more NATO maneuvers. Well, if you're Russia and you're looking at all this, you've seen this before when the Germans in 1941, they're not going to sit there forever while all kinds of hostile forces build up all around their borders and missile systems. They're not going to do it. In fact, they've said they're not going to. People need to start listening to what the Russians say before the people cease to exist. This is a serious thing. You can't go around picking a fight with the world's most powerful military, which is not the United States. I don't know if you saw the Iran study that came out last year. The Iran Corporation essentially is a CIA outpost. They were tasked with running all kinds of war games between NATO and Russia. And after a year or two or three of studies and war games, this Iran report came out last year and it said if there's war between... NATO and Russia, it'll be over with in 60 hours. Russia will simply overrun Europe. It will take them 60 hours, not 60 days. We are so outclassed militarily. Now, some people say, oh, well, the reason Rand said this is the military security complex wants a bigger budget, and they're using this. It's not really true, and they're using it. But I suspect there has to be some truth to it because there are too many military analysts still who are independent and who can look at these studies and they can say, wait a minute, this is all nonsense. And I haven't seen any of that. So to get back to the main point, what the United States is doing with NATO is forcing Europe into a conflict situation with Russia. But also the United States uses NATO as cover for its war crimes which it has committed in Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, Pakistan, Somalia. Without the NATO cover, this would be naked aggression. You know, people all over the world would be screaming to put the United States government on a Nuremberg war crimes trial. But because of the predominance of the U.S. and Europe, oh, this is some kind of a democratic operation. Look, all these countries support this. So what the Europeans do, they enable Washington's wars that now producing refugees that are overrunning Europe. That's how stupid the Europeans are. And the British, stupid. So you see this opportunity for Brexit to be vital and more important than what... I mean, what... The, 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 what we're normally told, of course, you know, is it's seen from the point of view of British perspective all the time. Will it be good for us? Will it be bad for us? And it's tempting to think along those ways and sort of weigh those up 50-50. But actually, you're saying that it has consequences that reach way beyond because then we could see the EU unravel. We could therefore see NATO unravel. And then many of the problems that you're talking about here would be overcome. Right. You see, what you have to understand is the United States right now is threatening the entire world with nuclear war because they're going to keep on picking a fight with Russia and China, and it's going to be nuclear. We have no possibility of conducting a conventional war against the Russians or against the Chinese, much less both of them simultaneously. Mm. And they now have a strategic alliance. So we are pushing the world toward a nuclear war. And it's the Europeans who enable this. If the Europeans were independent, had independent foreign policies, they would tell the Americans, no, we're not going to be part of this. we got good business relations with Russia. We're making money. We get along with them. They're not threatening us. We don't have any stake in Washington having hegemony over the world. doesn't do us any good. 
if you had real leaders in Europe, this is what they'd be saying. But of course, they're all bought and paid for. We all so you are saying that a Brexit vote is actually a vote against Washington's ridiculous attempt for its new world order. That's exactly right. That's right. And if you don't get the Brexit vote, the chances of nuclear war are greatly increased. So if Britain stays in the EU, we've lost another chance to begin the unraveling that would stop Washington's aggression. But even if we do get that Brexit vote, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen. We could have a repetition of what happened with Ireland with respect yeah. to the Maastricht Treaty, where people were given the second opportunity to vote the right way in inverted commas. I mean, that sort of thing could play out again, couldn't it? Yeah. Or the government simply won't accept mm. the vote. We already see this happening. I mean, you know, it wasn't long ago that one of your top generals said that if the new Labour leader is elected prime minister, we're not going to allow him to take office. He plead national security. So the yes. Respect, respect for democracy in the West is gone. It's dead. There's no respect for democracy. Look at Greece. Look at Greece. There's no respect for any democracy. The government's doing the opposite of what people want. Allegedly, it's a left wing socialist government. Look at France. They're doing the opposite of what the people want. You know, the people are all in the streets. What's the government doing? Everything they don't want. Yeah, that, that is actually very interesting because so often the view of the EU that we're given is that it's sort of gently, socially democratic. It's sort of left-leaning slightly. And yet, you know, there's a, a documentary that I saw recently that a listener kindly drew my attention to. It's called The Brussels Business, Who Runs the European Union? And it gives evidence there that the EU is massively influenced by corporate lobbyists. The institutions are surrounded by thousands of lobbying organizations and thousands of corporate lobbyists based in Brussels. So, I mean, that certainly gives the lie to the idea that it is gently left-leaning, <laughs> at least it seems to me. There's nothing left about it, nothing left-leaning about it. I mean, throughout the West, there's no left wing. It's all dead and gone. I mean, look at Tony Blair, this passed for a labor government. I mean, really? I mean, <laughs> it's more right-wing than Ronald Reagan. Look at uh, the so-called Socialist Party in France, Hollande, uh, Sarkozy. These people essentially are fascists. There's no respect anywhere in Europe for democracy. You don't see it. You know, the whole ideology is to accept rule from above. So, you know, in the United States, it's completely ruled by private oligarchic interests. Wall Street, uh, we have the military security complex. We have the Israel lobby. Agribusiness, you know, Monsanto, we have the extractive industries, you know, energy, mining, timber. Uh, these are the people yeah. who write all the laws, make all the regulations, staff up the Treasury, staff up the Federal Reserve, staff up the environmental protection agencies. They rule. And so why are you surprised in Europe. I mean, look, look at the... Well, I have to say, I'm not surprised. <laughs> not no. really surprised. Uh, but, you know, I just didn't know about the thousands of lobby organizations that were there. And I'd certainly not heard of one organization that's mentioned in that particular documentary called the European Roundtable of Industrialists. <laughs> and apparently that's made up of corporate CEOs. And it has privileged secret access to the very European Commission that we were talking about a little earlier. And it's just stacked with names that people will recognize. I mean, the membership includes just this is just a selection BASF, Heineken, Nestle, Vodafone, Rolls Royce, Sangobain, Total, uh, Bayer, Fiat, Philips, Ericsson, Siemens, Rio Tinto, BMW, Volvo, Eon, Royal Dutch Shell, Nokia. I mean, I could go on. That was just a small selection of them. And they have this secret access to the European Commission, right. which is the one that's supposed to be putting forward legislation to be voted upon. So the companies put forward the legislation, just like in the United States. Yeah. The, the politicians are just a front. They don't actually do anything. They, they provide cover, and the private interests run it. Look, even Monsanto, I bet you Monsanto's a member of that. It's an American firm. Notice the treatment or the acceptance that Monsanto and GMOs and glyphosate get from the EU, but they don't get from member countries like France. So France is now in the position, I saw the other day, where the minister responsible in France says, well, if the EU is going to give another seven years trial to glyphosate and GMOs, we're not. We're going to continue with our own prohibitions against it. So now you see a conflict 
between the EU law and France, who says we're not going to let our opposition to GMOs and glyphosate be overridden by the EU law. So these kinds of conflicts will get worse, but because the CIA is running the show, the individual governments are going to lose. So would you say then that ultimately the CIA and uh, other such organizations are behind the push for things like TTIP? Because, I mean, if, if TTIP sure. goes through, then what you've just been talking about, GMO and glyphosate, and people are just not, not going to be able to know that these things are in their food supplies. They're not going to be able to label anything, that sort of thing. Well, if that partnership goes through, what it does is it means Monsanto can sue France for the loss of revenues it would have earned if France did not have laws against GMOs. Mm. And the suit takes place not in courts of France, but in a corporate tribunal in which only corporations make the decision. And so all of these laws can be overturned by the corporation. So can any sort of health or safety regulation because this gets in the way of profits. In fact, I'm convinced they can even use it to get rid of taxation. What will happen in Britain, there will be these American medical care organizations, private will come in and force the national health to get out of the way. Otherwise, they're yeah, interfering yeah. with their profits. Well, we, we, so, we, we have talked about this. Well, we talked about the trade in services proposals, and um, we, we, we talked about there, there are these various assurances that are given which don't seem to be worth the paper they're written on. <laughs> um, no, the assurances oh. are lies. They're lies. Everything a government says mm. is a lie. Try to think of anything the government has said <laughs> in your lifetime that is true or believable. Every uh, time I'll have a go, but I don't think we've got time for me to sit and think. Um, <laughs> but, but presumably then, again, we would have to say that a vote for Brexit will be the end of something like TTIP as well. Yeah. Because if it ends the EU, then there's no block to negotiate with. That's right. That's right. See, the British people would be doing the whole world and themselves a massive favor. It would block the corporate takeover of Europe. It would block the American use of Europe to create hostility with Russia, and thereby it would greatly uh, remove the threat of war. But what we see now in Russia and the United States is massive increase in nuclear forces. Everything that Reagan and Gorbachev accomplished has been overturned by Washington. You know, Reagan and Gorbachev, you know, Reagan's two big goals, they went together, and you know, they were key toward ending the Cold War and ending the risk of nuclear Armageddon. He wanted nuclear weapons gone. And so what was achieved with Reagan and Gorbachev and the ending the Cold War, we now have a far worse situation. It's worse in every respect. The war doctrines of the countries have changed. It used to be a nuclear force was a retaliatory force only. You only used it if somehow you were attacked with nuclear weapons. Well, now both us and the Russians have nuclear first strike doctrines. So the situation is far more dangerous than it was at the height of the Cold War with the Soviet Union. And not only that, during the Cold War, American presidents and administrations made every kind of effort to be on good terms. They weren't demonizing the Soviet Union all day long. They didn't stand up and say uh, Khrushchev was the new Hitler like a likely future president has declared about Putin. Uh, they weren't making all kinds of false claims about Soviet invasions. They weren't telling lies every time they opened their mouth. They made every kind of effort to keep things stable. And Reagan said, we're tired of just trying to keep them stable. We've got to end this. There's too much risk. Something can go wrong. It's stupid that we're taking this risk and we have to end this. Well, now all these risks are back and they're multiplied. And if the British lose their nerve and vote to stay in, then that's just going to encourage Washington more. They're going to say, see, we've got them. We've got the whole world. We're going to go ahead and push harder. But the problem is, you see, none of what you've been talking about is made clear to the British people. It's all presented in terms of, is it good for the pound? Is it good for jobs? Can we trade with the rest of the world effectively? Will we be shut out of EU markets, etc.? And none of what you've just painted there is clarified to us at all. I know. 
I know. Oh. That's why I'm mm. saying. Yeah. But because we are sheltered from much of the reality of this situation, then the propaganda that we're bombarded with is having an effect. When I look at the uh, Financial Times poll of polls, which takes averages of many of the polls out there, I mean, if we were to trust that at all, um, it shows that back in 2013, there were many more people thinking of voting to leave. But since then, um, in 2015, there were more stay votes. And now, now there's a kind of a, an, an uncertainty oscillating back and forth. But it's worryingly close. And I, I'm very suspicious that, in fact, people will lose their nerve at the last minute. Because oh, I'm sure they we're will. constantly being told we mustn't vote for uncertainty. It's an uncertain future if we pull out of EU. And people like that feeling of, you know, of things being certain. And we like the familiar. And I think that's being played on in a big way. Sure, you're absolutely correct. Mm. And so the consequence is that uh, England will disappear, the British will disappear, their justice system will disappear, and the conflicts with Russia will uh, intensify and it'll end in war, and Europe simply will no longer exist in any form. And in fact, neither will the United States. And that's where we're headed. All the lies and propaganda that's being used against the judgment of the people to warp their judgment, to make them distrusted, to make them say, oh, well, it's all I hear is we'll lose. Well, why they believe anything the press says is a mystery to me. I mean, I, don't, I can't understand why any sentient human anywhere in the Western world would believe anything that the press says because it's nothing but propaganda and lies. Look, we had a couple of years ago, the German editor of the big German newspaper, he said, look, I'm a CIA agent. They hand me the stories that we print. This is true, he said, for every major news source throughout Europe. He didn't make this up. He published it. Sent a book. Ulfkotter or something like that. He says, sue me. Mm -hmm. He says, sue me. Go ahead, mm -hmm. sue me. Mm -hmm. No one sues him. It's true in England. You don't have any independent press. You see, I think the problem is that still too few people realize that this is the case. People generally still do trust institutions that are familiar sounding to them. And so we're getting this argument that the economic case has made that we should stay in the EU and the IMF thinks so, uh, the Bank of England thinks so. And so people listen to those names and think, oh, well, you know, the people who really know know what the score is, therefore, well, what do we know about it? We must just trust these very famous names that are telling us that we should not pull out of the EU. And yet you know, somebody like the Tory MP, very bright chap, Daniel Hannan, says that well, if we look at Europe, in fact, we've shackled ourselves to a corpse, he says. And we should have arrangements much more like Norway and Switzerland, which have these nice association agreements. They're allowed to trade with who they like. They have the benefit of EU trade, but they have this freedom. Yeah. Um, why are we shackled in this old-fashioned way that's based upon the sort of 1970s mentality when you know the UK was the sick man of Europe and looking across to what it thought was a, a better future for itself for being linked to the continent? This is an old way of thinking. And he says, in the, this day, we've got the internet. You know, international flight is so much more of Available, we can trade with who we like across the world. And yet, we have these august institutions telling us this is the way it is. And because people are so familiar with those institutions and haven't learned to distrust those institutions, they're listening to what they're saying. And my fear is that they won't think for themselves on this. Well, you're right. They won't. Propaganda generally prevails because of repetition. Mm. But in actual fact, the British people don't know what the Bank of England thinks. Uh, because if the Bank of England thinks that it's a bad idea to be in the EU, they're not going to say it. They wouldn't be permitted to say it. Right. And you're going to stay in the EU because that's where Washington wants you. It doesn't matter how you vote. You can vote 100% to exit. You won't be allowed to. You really think that's the case? Washington will say no. So we've got this 13% or something of the electorate that are wondering, shall I, shall I not? They're undecided. So if they decide for Brexit, you're saying it doesn't make any difference anyway. Just making Washington won't permit it. Or what will happen if you leave, then all of a sudden there's a massive attack on the pound. You know, Goldman Sachs will order the European Central Bank or the Japanese Central Bank. They're our puppets. They do what we tell them. Uh, the Federal Reserve will gang up, will drive the pound down to nothing. And then we'll say, see, see, this was caused by you leaving the EU. We well, didn't have anything to do with it. None of these central banks had anything to do with it. No, no, this 
There's no confidence in Britain. See, you've left the EU, there's no confidence, and then the government will say, well, we've got to go back in. So this is a kind of economic false flag attack, you're saying? Yeah, oh yeah. It'll be a massive attack. They won't admit they're doing it, and they'll say, okay, we told you not to exit. You've lo- everybody's lost confidence in the pound, and uh, everybody will be screaming, oh, we're ruined, we're ruined, and, and, and all the papers will say, see, you stupid people, you didn't listen to us, and look what's happened. And, government has to take us back instantly, we'll all starve to death. Okay, well, if that's the case, I mean, that then is a very negative scenario that you're painting. Surely you're not therefore saying, well, don't bother to vote, because surely there must be some point in actually voting for Brexit. It must flag up the issues, surely. It must register with everybody that there is this dissatisfaction with the EU, and that in itself must be a good thing, don't you think? Well, I think that what it would do, it might encourage some other members who don't have their own currency. Mm. Greece or Italy or Spain or Portugal, they don't face an attack on their currency to bring them in line like Britain does because they don't have a currency. They only have the euro. And clearly the central banks aren't going to destroy the euro because that doesn't do them any good in bringing Greece or Spain or whoever back into the EU. Right, okay, so it would embolden other people. Yeah, mm-hmm. so if, if the Greeks, for example, who are being driven into the ground, if they say, look, the British voted to get out, and they had to get back in because they have their own currency and it fell under attack, we don't have a currency. Well, why don't we vote to get out? Yeah. If the British could vote to get out, we could do that too. So it, it would be good in that sense. It would start the prospects of people actually voting to leave would take hold. There's a lot of reasons for people to vote to leave, especially for the Greeks, for the Portuguese, for the Italians, for the Spanish, possibly even the French. In that case, if it were to unravel from the, as it were, the poorer end of Europe, would you see it less as a a collapse of the EU, as a sort of a redefinition of the EU, so that it would just be perhaps the richer group separating off and letting the others go? Well, That would mean that instead of looting Greece, the Germans would have to loot France. See, Greece is being looted. The the debt issue is used to loot Greece. Mm. They're forced to turn over all of their public assets to private foreign investors. This is the reason the German and Dutch banks don't want any debt relief, because they're using the debt to loot Greece, like they did to Ireland to Latvia, to Portugal, and the way the United States has done to almost all of Latin America. You use debt to loot the countries, and that's what's happening to Greece. They're being looted. I mean, it's really severe, and so they've got no reason to be in there, and they're just intimidated. But if the British people voted to leave, they would say, hell, we could do that too, and we don't have a currency to fall under attack. So you see the strength that the British have of being in the EU with their own currency means that as long as they're in the EU and have their own currency, they can't be looted because debt can't be used to force them to turn over all their assets to the Germans or somebody. But it makes them impossible to leave because their currency is then exposed to attack and can be destroyed. And so... The strength becomes a weakness, whereas for the lesser countries with no currency, it's a strength. It's easier for them to get out. Mm. Can I ask you, going back to Daniel Hannan's comment that the EU is stagnant, is stagnating, um, do you think in some way it could always have been the intention of Washington that Europe be ineffective in economic terms? Because I just wonder that if there was the freedom of individual European nations to form trade associations with whoever they wanted to in the world, then arguably Europe might be economically stronger and so perhaps present greater competition for Washington. I don't know. I don't know about that. That's a speculative thing. I have no way of knowing. All I do know is that Washington wanted the EU for control reasons. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether they thought about all these economic aspects. 
But uh, as long as they were fearing uh, a Soviet threat, they would want the EU to be economically strong because they were very much worried about the Communist parties in Italy and France. And this is why Washington created Operation Gladio, Mm -hmm. where the CIA and various European intelligence agencies would go around bombing train stations in Europe, particularly in Italy, and kill a lot of people. And then they blame these mythical creations, red brigades, the Biden-Manhoff. These were all CIA fronts, so they would have somebody to blame for the bombs the CIA was setting off. We've actually talked to Daniela Ganza about that, a very yeah. interesting and, and, um, and disturbing and, disturbing subject. And at the same time, the CIA was also funding mild leftists in Europe so as to yeah. counter the effect of the Soviets on European soil. Right. So it's a very weird situation indeed. Right. So they would, want, they would have wanted a strong Europe, at least at that time. Uh, yeah. Right now, it's part of... You, you see, when the Soviet Union collapsed... That's when the neoconservative goal of American world hegemony really came to the fore. Not just having a European and Asian empire, but look, the only thing in our way, the Soviet Union is gone. So we can now have the whole world as our empire. So the collapse of the Soviet Union is what unleashed this hegemonic demon that now threatens the world with nuclear annihilation. So if the EU were to break up, NATO were to break up, it would take that threat to human life away. But as long as the EU is there, NATO is there, the threat is going to worsen. If you look at the attacks on Russia, they are reckless. They are really reckless, irresponsible. And everybody repeats them. We're constantly being told about Russian aggression. Yeah. Yes, all the time. If Russia was aggressing somebody... We would know it. They wouldn't. Those people wouldn't be there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and it's crazy. Why in the world would the Russians bother to invade the Baltics? There's nothing there. Uh, they gave Baltics their independence. What do they want to go invade them for? Uh, the, what, the Baltics can't do anything to Russia. <laughs> it would be a total pointless thing. There's no sign of it. There's no Russian plans. There's no build up. It's just all ridiculous. And yet all these things become facts. These are facts, man. Well, David Cameron was treating it as a, as a fact yeah. at that very time he was speaking to Obama, saying you know, it's a good job that the EU exists and that uh, Britain has its place at the table yeah. so that uh, the things we're concerned about can become a reality, such as sanctions against aggressive Russia. <laughs> How many times have we heard this place at the table? They yes. pull it out every year for my entire life. Yes. I mean, I can remember I was in Oxford in the 60s. We had listened to this place at the table stuff. Like, <laughs> the only way we count is if we don't count and we're part of something bigger. If we're at somebody else's table, yes. <laughs> yeah. As long as we are a lackey for somebody who counts, we count. This was the British attitude even then. And I just was wondering, I said, what happened to this great nation? You know, I mean, you know, liberty is a human achievement. It was mainly achieved by the British. All of the great legal traditions that the British colonies ended up benefiting from were fought for by the British people for centuries. It took centuries to get accountable government and to get the people protected by the rule of law. In other words, the British fought for centuries to take law as a weapon out of the hands of the government and make it a shield of the people. The most important part of British history is the creation of liberty by transforming law from a weapon in the hands of government into a shield that protects the people. It's a British achievement. The colonies benefited from it. Now it's all being thrown away. But the British people do have an opportunity now to do the right thing, to quote David Cameron, who's always talking about doing the right thing. Well, in this case, perhaps it is the right thing to vote to get out of the EU. And even if that doesn't mean that in the end that Britain does leave for reasons of pressure from Washington, nevertheless, it could embolden other countries to take their own decision. Yeah. And that could lead to the unraveling. So if, the, if that is the case, then we do actually have a very serious opportunity to change something here. It's not just a case of voting for Britain. It's voting for a much wider right. uh, view. For humanity. It's a vote for yeah. humanity. For life on Earth. It could well be. What's yeah. at stake is life on Earth. And the fact that the British do this 
it changes everybody's mentality. You know, whether the British could make it stand or not, mm -hmm. it still changes everybody's mentality. They say, look, the British didn't believe all that rot. Why do we believe it? And so the whole propaganda power of government collapses. So that's the most important thing about a no vote. It shows the people weren't fooled this time by the government's lies. They saw through the propaganda. That's the important thing. It's so important because then everybody else in Europe, in the United States, Canada, Australia, they all say, hey, why do we believe it? And all of a sudden, the propaganda basis of all Western governments is gone. That's the only way that people would ever get control back over their lives and over the government. Right now, they got zilch control, especially in the United States. Well, thank you ever so much, Dr. Roberts, for sharing your views with us on this. You heard it here, folks, listening to this particular interview. We here in the UK, we do have an opportunity just about a month from now to make a real difference. It isn't just about us. It's about the whole world, and it could be a really significant vote. So you've heard there what Dr. Roberts thinks, and it's always brilliant to hear what he has to say. And so I thank you ever so much, Dr. Roberts, for coming on and sharing with us your views. It's wonderful to speak to you. Well, Julian, I very much appreciate the opportunity and, and your program and to be on your program. And I always welcome the opportunity. Thank you ever so much for joining us again. I look forward to speaking to you again on another subject. Yes, it's a mutual on my part. Okay. Okay, thank you ever so much. You're thank certainly you. welcome. Bye-bye then. Goodbye. Well, once again, thanks for listening. And let me encourage you, if you are here in the UK and you found this interview helpful in deciding how you're going to vote this coming 23rd of June, then please do share this conversation with people. As you know, I rarely ask for support in that way because, well, basically because I don't like blowing my own trumpet. But in cases like this, where the information is, I think, really important, not because of my contribution, but because of the contribution of my guest, then I feel I'm justified in asking. Please do share this conversation around on social media, by word of mouth, however you can do it especially if you are here in the UK or you have contacts with people in the UK, because as Dr. Robert says, we have an opportunity here, maybe not to decide what happens to Britain in the short term, but maybe to make a political statement that will reverberate around Europe and give courage to others to make a stand for their own independence and freedom. And maybe that will have an effect that will be good for us all. So please do share this around and, and please do vote if you're here. This is an opportunity. It's not perfect. Of course, it's not a perfect state of affairs, but it is an opportunity. So let's make use of what we have. And I'll just say in passing, thank you very much, Mark, for sending me those links, which did prove very helpful with that interview. And those, of course, will be included in the show notes, as will many other items mentioned in this interview, such as the really informative interview we had with Dr. Daniela Ganza on Operation Gladio, for example, which I mentioned in that conversation with Dr. Roberts. I always do try to include as much information as I can in the notes, so please do check those out. There's a link, there's always a link to them on the page where the interview is displayed. Also, there will be no podcast next week for two reasons, really. One is it's next week that the hosting changeover is going to be happening, where TMR shifts to a different server at the hosting company. And as I said before, that means there's every possibility that TMR will be out of action completely uh, for somewhere between 24 and 48 hours during that week. Uh, obviously, that's not a comfortable thought. Um, so if you navigate over here and find it gone, then please do not send me emails asking where it's gone because it won't really have gone. It'll be coming back before you can say uh, Jack Robinson. Uh, that's what we say here in the... I don't know why we say that, but that's what we say here. Before you can say Jack Robinson, it'll be back again. But of course, um, I want to monitor the situation and I don't want the hassle of putting out a show just as really weird things are happening to the site. And the second thing is, it's half term now and we have a ton of redecorating to do now that the plastering has all been done following our flood. So we're going to be spending the next week uh, 
buttoned up in overalls and slapping paint on the walls, uh, which is not something I'm terribly familiar with. So I'm uh, going to be taking a break from the podcast for the next week. And as I say, monitoring what's going on with the website. But in the following week, we will be speaking again with Reverend Dr. Robert Bennett, this time about his new book, Afraid, which looks at the issue of spiritual oppression in the US today, which is a kind of sequel to his field research book on Madagascan spiritualities, which we discussed with him before. And in the following week, we'll be speaking again with Tom Gailey for the third in our short series of interviews inspired by his book, America's Post-Christian Apocalypse which I again encourage you to get so once again please do share this interview around there's not long to go and I would love as many people as possible to hear what Dr. Roberts has to say you have been listening to me Julian Charles of themindrenewed.com and I very much look forward to speaking to you again in the fairly near future for the creation of the EU for two reasons. One, as a block against uh, the Soviets, and two, as enabling Washington's control, because to control all the separate European governments is much more time-consuming, demanding, involved than controlling an EU government especially something with an EU commission that's not accountable. And so Washington set it up in order to have a firm hold on its European empire. And this goes back to, according to Ambrose Evans Pritchard, this goes back to the 1950s and 60s, I understand. Uh, yes, back to the 50s, I think it was. Mm. I don't have my article in front of me, but um, it was a creation of the CIA as a way of enhancing Washington's empire. You know, for Washington to have to go to Italy, to France, to Germany, to the British, uh, negotiate with each of these governments, the more people you have to bribe or threaten or cajole, and then the countries themselves can uh, increase their demands for what they want in return, because if one holds out, no deal can be made. Whereas, if Europe is dissolved, if the European countries are dissolved into one entity, then Washington only has to deal with one entity. And so this was the origin of the EU for that purpose. It facilitates Washington's control, and that is why Washington has pushed so strongly to put all of Eastern Europe. Miranda, um, let me just have a look at a number of things that are said here. One of the memos, this is June the 11th, 1965, advised the Vice President of the EEC, uh, Robert Marjolin, quote, to pursue monetary union by stealth, and it recommends that uh, all debate be suppressed until, quote, the adoption of such proposals would become virtually inescapable. So yeah. these are memos from the CIA that are going through the, yeah. to the Vice President of the EEC. Right. The whole thing was a CIA orchestration. They used various Europeans mm. for it, mm. and always with some cover or pretext. Um, the documents are publicly available. Once they're released, I don't think they can then be all of a sudden reclassified. Right, so they could be checked up on, yeah. Yeah, and so all anyone would have to do would be go to the National Archive and ask for them. Clearly, it's so. It's not something being asserted. It's based on the actual CIA documents. I mean, they admit it. <laughs> yeah, and people involved, um, he actually you know, mentions a number of people. It, it seems pretty clear this is the case. I mean, he looks at this organization called an American Committee for a United Europe that apparently was created in 1948. And he says it's, it was chock full of intelligence people. Um, the chairman apparently was William J. Donovan, who had been head of the OSS, the uh, Office of Strategic Services, forerunner of the CIA, who at the time was apparently, well, ostensibly a private lawyer at the time. The vice chairman was, of all people, Alan Dulles. <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah, um, and, the, <laughs> and the board included um, the CIA's first director, and he says a, a roster <laughs> of ex OSS figures and officials who moved in and out of the CIA. So there it is. <laughs> yeah, this was uh, clearly done, and, and it's more particularly because of what you say about something else connected to this: the historical links between the EU. And of all things, U.S. intelligence, which is very fascinating. But perhaps we should start with your more general impressions of what's going on at the moment. You you write in the piece that Washington is committed to the European project because it's in its own interests that that should continue, and you say that basically it's David Cameron's job, presumably under Obama's instruction, to this is what you say scare the British people into thinking that it's too dangerous to go it alone. So let's start there. Why? Why is Washington so averse to the Brexit vote? Well, Julian, um, we really should then start with what you are going to get to later. Mm -hmm. The EU is a creation of the CIA. And this was discovered uh, some years ago by an American professor who happened upon uh, released documents in the archive of the United States where public documents are put when they are released from their, you know, their time holding. Was it Georgetown University? I think I read somewhere. Georgetown or George Washington, I think it was. uh, But you see, it was reported on by the Telegraph, by Ambrose Evans Pritchard Hmm. in the year 2000. And I think I mentioned that in my column, that this was 16 years ago reported in the Telegraph by Hmm. Ambrose, who was for a while, I guess, the Telegraph's correspondent in Washington. And um, the documents show that the CIA did this, basically organized, orchestrated, lobbied for into both the EU and NATO, because otherwise, how many countries are there, European? I can't remember the Eastern, the Western, the 28 or 29? I think it's 28, yeah. Yeah, and, and so instead of having to deal with 28 separate governments, uh, Washington can achieve what it wants dealing with the EU. So this this is the origin. And In, indeed, it's fascinating. I mean, one of the things that comes to my mind is I've had uh, interviews with Patrick Wood, and uh, he has said things along these lines. I mean, he's very much looking at the work of the Trilateral Commission over the years. And one of the quotes he has in his book, Technocracy Rising, comes from a private conversation with David Rockefeller, which is published by and available for free download from the Trilateral Commission. So I'll link to that. So this is Pat Wood citing the words of David Rockefeller. Quote, Uh, Back in the early 70s, the hope for a united Europe, and that's all in capital letters, Europe, uh, was already full-blown, thanks in many ways to the individual energies previously spent by so many of the Trilateral Commission's earliest members. So (laughs) there is a little window into this interest that was there, as you say, going right back to the 1950s. Yeah, it's an American creation, the EU is. It was uh, orchestrated through... European individuals and under various pretexts and it was done in stages but it was essentially a CIA operation and you have to understand this is not what the professor is saying or Ambrose Evans Pritchard is saying this is what the released CIA documents say. <laughs> right, right. Sure when you actually go to the article that he wrote there in the year 2000 I can see that's what he says here though he doesn't actually link through to any of those documents but of course one could double check on all of that but he points to various memorandums Hello everybody, Julian Charles here of TheMindRenewed.com, coming to you as usual from the depths of the Lancashire countryside here in the UK. And today I'm very pleased to welcome back to the programme a guest who is always very much appreciated for his uh, great insights into matters political and economic, Dr Paul Craig Roberts. Dr Roberts has held numerous senior academic positions in universities. He was an associate editor and columnist for the Wall Street Journal and was appointed by President Reagan as Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Economic Policy during Reagan's first term in office. After that, Dr. Roberts served as a consultant to the U.S. Departments of Defense and Commerce, and he is now chairman of the Institute for Political Economy, which you can find online at paulcraigroberts.org. Dr. Roberts, thanks very much for coming back on the show. Pleased to be with you, Julia. 
Well, it's always a pleasure to speak with you. I mean, certainly your posts over there at paulcleagroberts.org are, you know, they continue to be a source of good information and, well, to a certain extent, a relief to me and I expect to many others. <laughs> it's a kind of oasis of sanity and calm in a world that seems to be going mad in many ways. So it is, it's always great to speak with a calm and sane person. So thanks very much for coming on. And today I want to talk about a piece that you wrote on your website earlier this month called Somnolent Europe, Russia and China, and particularly because of what you say there about the European Union and the upcoming referendum here in the UK as to whether uh, we Britons should stay or leave that union. And uh, as we have this decision to make shortly on the 23rd of June, do we go for Brexit, do we not? I thought that it would be good to hear your views on this. And even what the released CIA documents say. <laughs> right, right. Sure. When you actually go to the article that he wrote there in the year 2000, I can see that's what he says. Although he doesn't actually link through to any of those documents. But of course, one could double check on all of that. But he points to various memoranda. Um, let me just have a look at a number of things that are said here. One of the memos, this is June the 11th, 1965, advised the Vice President of the EEC, uh, Robert Marjolin, quote, to pursue monetary union by stealth, and it recommends that uh, all debate be suppressed until, quote, the adoption of such proposals would become virtually inescapable. So yeah. these are memos from the CIA that are going through the, yeah. to the Vice President of the EEC. Right. The whole thing was a CIA orchestration. They used various Europeans for it, and always with some cover or pretext. Um, the documents are publicly available. Once they're released, I don't think they can then be all of a sudden reclassified. Right, so they could be checked up on, yeah. Yeah, and so all anyone would have to do would be go to the National Archive and ask for them. Clearly, it's so. It's not something being asserted. It's based on the actual CIA documents. I mean, they admit it. <laughs> yeah, and people involved, um, he actually you know, mentions a number of people. It, it seems pretty clear this is the case. I mean, he looks at this organization called an American Committee for a United Europe that apparently was created in 1948. And he says it's, it was chock full of intelligence people. Um, the chairman apparently was William J. Donovan, who had been head of the OSS, the uh, Office of Strategic Services, forerunner of the CIA, who at the time was apparently, well, ostensibly a private lawyer at the time. The vice chairman was, of all people, Alan Dulles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, the, <laughs> and the board included um, the CIA's first director, and he says a, a roster <laughs> of ex-OSS figures and officials who moved in and out of the CIA. So there it is. <laughs> yeah, this was uh, clearly done, and it, and it succeeded because Europe is very firmly under American control. Uh, Washington controls uh, Europe totally. Controls its foreign policy, its economic policy, controls whatever the various elected presidents say or don't say, uh, force retractions. And uh, Obama's recent visit to London was to tell Cameron to deep six this British exit from the EU. Uh, that's his marching orders, and he will do everything he can to comply because Cameron is, like every British prime minister, a puppet of Washington. He has no independent standing. He can't put uh, British interests ahead of American interests. He's not allowed. It's quite clear, as Obama said, it's American interests for Britain to stay in the EU. So what, what most likely happens in these situations is the, the leaders go to people and say, oh, little England, we will be insignificant by ourselves if we're not part of this big block of Europe. We'll lose our influence. If we stay in the EU, we'll have a lot of influence because we are important in the EU. But if we're not in the EU, we're not important. Mm. Things will pass us by. Little England will be little England. That's exactly and, what they do, yes. And in fact, one of the yeah. controversial things over here has been in recent months that the government spent £9 million of taxpayers' money on this glossy pamphlet that's been sent, because we, I've got one right here, um, you know, to vote, stay, that's what they say we should do. And this glossy leaflet is headed HM Government, of course, so it looks nice and official. And it's titled, uh, Why the Government Believes that Voting to Remain in the European Union is the Best Decision for the UK. And it has several points. 
points, uh, some of which you've just mentioned there. Uh, apparently, they secured a special status for the UK in Europe. We're not going to join the euro. Uh, we can keep control of our borders. We'll not be part of further European political integration, apparently. Um, tough new restrictions on access to welfare for EU migrants. And uh, they say they have a commitment to reduce EU red tape. Do you believe any of that? No, I don't believe any of it. They always, this is the trick that the British government always pulls on the people whenever the issue of the EU comes up. They say, oh, we're negotiating special conditions. Mm. We're negotiating special conditions. So don't worry. Don't, you don't have to worry about the immigrants because we're negotiating that part of the EU out of our relationship. You don't have to worry about EU laws taking precedence of British laws. Uh, but of course, we will continue to allow them to arrest you and pull you out of the country. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it doesn't actually say that in the pamphlet, no. <laughs> <laughs> because somebody uh, in Greece or something files a complaint. So they use the combination of reassurance that we have a special deal with fear that all oh, will be ruined if we're not in. So I, I don't know that the British people succeed in standing up for themselves or where they'll lose their confidence about leaving. Now, in a real respect, Britain is not in the EU because you still have the pound. And so unlike Greece or Italy or Portugal or Spain, when you get in financial trouble, the British can simply print pounds to get out. You're not dependent on private banks. You have your own central bank. But countries that use the euro do not have their own central bank in the sense of a money-creating bank because the central banks of the other euro members are no longer central banks. They still have that name, but they cannot print euros. Only the European Central Bank. And that's not controlled by the members. It is by Germany, more or less. But the other members, they have no real control over the European Central Bank, which really is run by a former Goldman Sachs executive. <laughs> the same people who run the U.S. Treasury and the Federal Reserve. <laughs> they also run the European Central Bank. So in a sense, does that mean that the UK is actually pretty much OK as things stand and we don't need a Brexit? I mean, after all, as you say, we, we're not part of the euro and they say there's going to be no further European political integration as far as the UK is concerned. So are we OK to just stay as we are? No, because you're OK for now if you get into financial trouble. They can't come in make you uh, get rid of public services, uh, national health, cut the pensions, and uh, sell off all of your public assets to... The documents show that the CIA did this, basically organized, orchestrated, lobbied for the creation of the EU for two reasons. One, as a block against uh, the Soviets, and two, as enabling Washington's control, because to control all the separate European governments is much more time-consuming, demanding, involved than controlling an EU government, especially something with an EU commission that's not accountable. And so Washington set it up in order to have a firm hold on its European empire. And this goes back to, according to Ambrose Evans Pritchard, this goes back to the 1950s and 60s, I understand. Uh, yes, back to the 50s, I think it was. Mm. I don't have my article in front of me, but um, it was a creation of the CIA as a way of enhancing Washington's empire. You know, for Washington to have to go to Italy, to France, to Germany, to the British... Uh, negotiate with each of these governments. The more people you have to bribe or threaten or cajole, and then the countries themselves can uh, increase their demands for what they want in return, because if one holds out, no deal can be made. Whereas if Europe is dissolved, if the European countries are dissolved into one entity, then Washington only has to deal with one entity. And so this was the origin of the EU for that purpose. It facilitates 
Washington's control. And that is why Washington has pushed so strongly to put all of Eastern Europe into both the EU and NATO, because otherwise, how many countries are there, European? I can't remember the Eastern, the Western, the 28 or 29? I think it's 28, yeah. Yeah, and and so instead of having to deal with 28 separate governments, uh, Washington can achieve what it wants dealing with the EU. So this this is the origin. And In, indeed, it's fascinating. I mean, one of the things that comes to my mind is I've had uh, interviews with Patrick Wood, and uh, he has said things along these lines. I mean, he's very much looking at the work of the Trilateral Commission over the years. And one of the quotes he has in his book, Technocracy Rising, comes from a private conversation with David Rockefeller, which is published by and available for free download from the Trilateral Commission. So I'll link to that. So this is Pat Wood citing the words of David Rockefeller. Quote, Uh, Back in the early 70s, the hope for a united Europe, and that's all in capital letters, Europe, uh, was already full-blown, thanks in many ways to the individual energies previously spent by so many of the Trilateral Commission's earliest members. So (laughs) there is a little window into this interest that was there, as you say, going right back to the 1950s. Yeah, it's an American creation, the EU is. It was uh, orchestrated through... European individuals and under various pretexts and it was done in stages but it was essentially a CIA operation and you have to understand this is not what the professor is saying or Ambrose Evans Pritchard is saying this is Hello everybody, Julian Charles here of TheMindRenewed.com, coming to you as usual from the depths of the Lancashire countryside here in the UK. And today I'm very pleased to welcome back to the programme a guest who is always very much appreciated for his uh, great insights into matters political and economic, Dr Paul Craig Roberts. Dr Roberts has held numerous senior academic positions in universities. He was an associate editor and columnist for the Wall Street Journal and was appointed by President Reagan as Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Economic Policy during Reagan's first term in office. After that, Dr. Roberts served as a consultant to the U.S. Departments of Defense and Commerce, and he is now chairman of the Institute for Political Economy, which you can find online at paulcraigroberts.org. Dr. Roberts, thanks very much for coming back on the show. Pleased to be with you, Julia. Well, it's always a pleasure to speak with you. I mean, certainly your posts over there at paulcraigroberts.org are, you know, they continue to be a source of good information and, well, to a certain extent, a relief to me and I expect to many others. It's a kind of oasis of sanity and calm in a world that seems to be going mad in many ways. So it's it's always great to speak with a calm and sane person. So thanks very much for coming on. And today I want to talk about a piece that you wrote on your website earlier this month called Somnolent Europe, Russia and China, and particularly because of what you say there about the European Union and the upcoming referendum here in the UK as to whether uh, we Britons should stay or leave that union. And uh, as we have this decision to make shortly on the 23rd of June, do we go for Brexit, do we not? I thought that it would be good to hear your views on this. And even more particularly because of what you say about something else connected to this, the historical links between the EU And of all things, U.S. intelligence, which is very fascinating. But perhaps we should start with your more general impressions of what's going on at the moment. You you write in the piece that Washington is committed to the European project because it's in its own interests that that should continue. And you say that basically it's David Cameron's job, presumably under Obama's instruction to, this is what you say, scare the British people into thinking that it's too dangerous to go it alone. So let's start there. Why is Washington so averse to the Brexit vote? Well, Julian, um, we really should then start with what you are going to get to later. Mm -hmm. The EU is a creation of the CIA. And this was discovered uh, some years ago by an American professor who happened upon uh, released documents in the archive of the United States where public documents are put when they are released from their, you know, their time holding. Was it Georgetown University? I think I read somewhere. Georgetown or George Washington. I think it was. Uh, but you see, it was reported on by the Telegraph, by Ambrose Evans Pritchard in the year 2000. And I think I mentioned that in my column, that this was 16 years ago 
reported in the Telegraph by hmm. Ambrose, who was for a while, I guess, the Telegraph's correspondent in Washington, and um, private investors abroad. They can't do that to you. But, of course, you can't really be in the EU and not be in the EU. And so what happens over time is you get gradually a little bit more in it, a little bit more in it. And already your legal system is compromised. British justice is different from European. Evidence is different. Rights of the accused are different. So already you are losing the kinds of historical achievements that the British people fought for for centuries, beginning with Magna Carta or even maybe earlier with Alfred the Great's uh, codification of the common law. But the type of English approach to justice, which is unique in which the United States copied, uh, this is not present on the continent. The people don't have the same rights and therefore you're already losing aspects of these historic British accomplishments by being in the EU. And you think that process would continue, irrespective of what any oh, of government it, here says, yeah. that there would continue yeah. to be effectively, like yeah. that quote I had yeah. before there, a continued sort of suppression of debate such that it would just seem inevitable in the end? Right, that's exactly it. It's gradually happening. Britain is more in the EU now than it was, say, five years ago. And... Uh, I suspect that Washington will urge the process along quicker. You know, the EU, it doesn't really make any sense to be in the EU because it destroys sovereignty. It destroys the power of the national government. But they say it's good for trade. They say, no, you know, they say 44% of UK trade is with the EU. This is this market of over 500 million customers. You know, if, if we were to pull out, then uh, we would lose that or we'd lose access, the kind well, of access that we have lie. at the moment. They lie. There's no reason to have political integration to have open markets. For example, we have open markets with Canada and Mexico, but we're not in some kind of a political unity with them. Yeah. So I agree. that's just I, a lie. Yeah. You know, all governments lie. Sure, but I, I agree in principle that you don't need to be part of a trading block in order to do trade. But yeah. I mean, one point that uh, Leon Britton made, not one of my favorite characters, but it was a point that he made, that we would be penalized. We would not really be able to trade well with the rest of the EU, they would penalize us with various tariffs. And so well, so he's lying through his teeth. Look, a trade bloc is not a political union. You don't have to have a political union in order to have a free trade zone. Mm. And originally, part of the deceit that was practiced on the Europeans was this will be a free trade zone. Then the CIA sprang on them, oh, it's going to be a political union. Well, that's another thing that Leon Britton said in one of the debates. He said that, in fact, it was known that it would be a political union and that Harold Macmillan had made that clear back in the 1960s. I might add that Nigel Farage said that was a lot of rubbish, but uh, that's what Leon Britton said. Yeah, but, well, you can go research it. It was not a political thing. It was part of the whole deception. First, it was a, a iron and coal or steel and coal union where there's going to be some kind 